Stevens presents Capital Thinking, the state of acquisitions and divestitures in upstream oil and gas. This conversation will feature the perspectives of industry CEOs and Stevens experts on the environment for upstream A&D transactions, capital allocation strategies for 2021, as well as the availability and options for capital throughout the year. Stevens investment banking experts, Charles LaPere, managing director and co-head of acquisitions and divestitures, and Brad Nelson, managing director and co-head of acquisitions and divestitures, are joined by Farley Dakin, president of Contego Oil and Gas Company, and Robert Anderson, chief executive officer and president of Earthstone Energy, Inc. Hello, I'm Brad Nelson, and managing director and co-head of acquisitions and divestitures in Stevens Energy Investment Banking Group. Welcome to Capital Thinking Energy Insights for today's market. This virtual thought leadership webinar series explores the challenges and opportunities affecting the energy industry. Stevens has a long history of serving in this space. The firm has been a principal investor since 1952 and then the Stevens Energy Investment Banking Practice began in 2009. We have expertise in the E&P, midstream, oil field services, as well as alternative and renewable energy. Our dedicated energy team, which now consists of about 20 professionals, has completed about 170 transactions to date while providing unmatched investment banking services on M&A advisory, fairness opinions, public and private debt and equity offerings. During 2020, our energy A&D group made a concerted effort to add expertise and bolster our technical capabilities. We added three professionals uh, starting at the end of 19 and in 2020, and have added people from groups like Wells Fargo A&D, UBS A&D, ExxonMobil, as well as Netherlands Sewell & Associates. Our group remains focused on advising companies with upstream and mineral royalty asset sales in the $100 to $200 million transaction size and also provides buy side and asset valuation advisory services. As of late, we've been very active in several basins, including the Eagleford, the Permian, and the Haynesville Shale. We've also been very active in the mineral and royalty space. My co host today is Charlie LaPere, who is also a managing director and co head of acquisitions and divestitures in our energy group. Charlie, welcome to the conversation. Thanks, Brad. The focus of our webinar today is the state of acquisitions and divestitures in the oil and gas market. Discussion topics uh, today are the current market environment for upstream transactions, capital allocation strategies, as well as the availability and options for upstream capital in 2021. In addition to drilling oil and gas wells, the lifeblood of the oil and gas industry are asset acquisitions and merger transactions and having access to a variety of capital options to facilitate growth. We're delighted to welcome to our webinar discussion two industry leaders that are experts in creative deal making and accessing the capital markets. With us today are uh, Farley Dakin, president of Contango Oil and Gas Company. Welcome Farley and thank you for participating. Thanks for having me, Charlie. Thanks, Brad. Also joining us as a guest speaker today is Robert Anderson, Chief Executive Officer and President of Earthstone Energy. Robert, welcome and thank you. Hey, thanks, Charlie and Brad and the whole Stevens crew for inviting Earthstone today. You're welcome. Contango is an independent oil and gas company with a business model of maximizing production and cash flow from its properties in the Mid-Continent, the Rockies, the Permian Basin, and the Gulf Coast. Contango has been an active acquirer recently and seeks to scale its business through shallow decline, PDP-weighted transactions with minimal drilling requirements in its core operating areas. Earthstone is an independent energy company that develops and operates a portfolio of un unconventional oil and gas properties. The company's core operations are focused in West Texas in the Midland Basin and in South Texas in the Eagle for Shale Play. And they employ a strategy of growing through the drill bit, leasing, and M&A transactions. Earthstone has been an active acquirer of late, announcing a meaningful acquisition in December. Brad, would you like to go ahead and kick off our discussion uh, with the first set of questions? Thank you, Charlie. Farley, I'll ask you this question first, and then Robert and Charlie, I'd like for you to follow up after Farley. 
Farley, how do you see this year shaping up in terms of upstream A and D activity and sentiment, and and what do you see happening differently from this from this time last year? Well, I mean, there's certainly more processes in 2021 than 2020. Um, and this time, about this time last year, we were about to go into you know basically a shell shock to our whole industry. Um, you know, bid ask spreads were, were really blew out last year, and it just you know just stopped all A and D transactions for all intents and purposes. And there were lots of restructurings going on. So, you know, it feels to us like there's there's a lot more post reorg situations coming to market you know, regular way A and D situations come into market and, and corporate divestitures that have come to market, you know, as of late, this recent price uptick is is adding to that sum. Um, so, you know, and, and I, I think the equity and debt capital markets have, you know, you know, healed themselves a bit, you know, we're not out of the woods and that's not, you know, flowing as readily as it, as it once, once was, but um, it's, it's starting to heal a little bit. Yeah, I would echo Farley's comments uh, right spot on. I mean, we, we, we spent a lot of time last year evaluating companies that needed to restructure, and we figured out after a while that there was nothing we could do ahead of time to help that process. They needed to go through um, sometimes a court-ordered process to restructure. But this year, the environment is, is uh, 180 degrees different, um, and, and sellers are receptive. Uh, and we see, like Farley mentioned, a lot of processes happening, whether it's uh, smaller companies or just assets, uh, non-core being sold out of uh, larger institutions. So that and the capital markets opening up, it makes a good opportunity for us who are in the, in the acquisition market and looking to be buyers. What, what I'd say is uh, in terms of A&D transactions for 2020, uh, 21 and our expectations are that, you know, with the increase in WTI prices so far in 2021 and seemingly getting the pandemic under control, you know, my sense is that, you know, there's cautious optimism for an improved Andy market in 2021. But as we all know and have experienced in 2019 and 2020, those were very, very challenging years for AD activity. If you go back to 2016 and look at 2016 through 2018, normal A&D activity has been, uh, during those years, about 250 deals per year. In 2019, we saw, we saw that dramatically decrease in terms of deal volume, going from about 250 deals a year down to 100 deals a year. And these are A&D transactions, not corporate transactions. Um, in 2020, we went from 100 deals in 2019 down to 50 uh, deals that were closed in 2020. So a significant decrease in the number of deals. In terms of dollar volume, um, you know, we only saw about $5.5 billion of A&D transactions closed in 2020. Normally, you know, when I say going back to 2016 through 2018, that deal volume was more like 50 billion dollars of A&D deals. So significant decrease in 2020. It's not very difficult to go up from 2020 levels, we don't think. Um, and it's, the critical factors are going to be, you know, um, our oil and gas price is going to be relatively stable. Uh, they don't have to be sky high, they don't have to be, hopefully they won't be very low like they were in 2020, but they just need to be relatively stable. So that's going to be a significant uh, piece of the puzzle going into 2021 to see whether or not we're going to have increased A and D activity. Also, uh, relative in, uh, illiquidity of of debt and equity capital that was a difficult thing to deal with in in 2020, especially, and and the significant gaps between buyer and seller value um, asset valuations were, were difficult. Hopefully, we'll see we'll see a difference uh, for the better in 2021. Farley, I will direct this next question to you. How competitive do you see the A&D market from a buy side perspective? And how does a more competitive buyer landscape affect your interest level in pursuing acquisitions? Well, it's certainly more competitive. Uh, I think, you know, the way that we look at what our platform is geared to do, we, you know, we're trying to be a consolidator and somewhat be, you know, basic ag agnostic. You know the the competition usually lies you know within a certain basin or or at a at a deal level, 
not, you know, corporately, we don't feel like at this point anyway. Um, and our strategy to, to mitigate that competition is really just to cast a wide net. We have lots of lines on the water at any given point in time, you know, kind of to Robert's point, you know, a lot of these things, you know, you're tracking way up process so that you can kind of be ready and be smart on the dynamics of the deal and or the assets, you know, whenever there is something that's, you know, actionable. But, you know, it's it's certainly more competitive, you know, on a deal by deal basis. But um, we think there's, you know, a way to mitigate that. Robert, I'll direct this next question to you. And then, Charlie, I'd like to hear your opinion as well. Over the last year or two, a number of transactions did not close due to a fairly wide bid ask spread. Have you seen that gap begin to close at all, given the recent commodity price activity and run up? Or if not, what do you think are the main factors causing valuation differences between buyers and sellers? I think in one thing that Charlie uh, touched on that really helps the bid ask spread is the volatility in prices. If we just get a stable strip price, then uh, deals can get done. And I think that buyers and sellers are starting to use similar commodity price decks in their uh, evaluation or thought process of either buying or selling assets. So that's, that's one that definitely will help. Uh, I still do believe that the bid-ask spread in certain situations um, is pretty wide. And that is based on where I see deals being cash flow heavy or those that are still acreage heavy. And deals that are acreage heavy uh, are going to have some difficulty getting across the finish line because we as buyers are looking for that cash flow component. Uh, a lot of times we're all uh, at least if you're playing a drilling play, you're probably pretty full of inventory as a public company already. Uh, you always want to improve your inventory, but if somebody is selling mostly inventory, it's a lot hard, harder to finance. And uh, uh, that's where that bid ask spread comes into play in these days. So we're focused on cash flowing assets with some running room, but cash flowing being the key term there. You know, one of the reasons, one of the significant factors why we've had a significant bid ask spread in the recent past is because I think we've had so much volatility, especially a downdraft in, in particularly oil prices. Um, a lot of a lot of buyers acquired their assets in much higher price environments uh, where there was a significant appetite to pay for undeveloped or non-producing upside. The current environment doesn't really allow for that. Uh, not only that, we're, we've seen, you know, for years and years and years, PDP reserves were valued at basically PDP PV10. And that, that was the rule for years. Uh, you know, in the, in the last year or so, that's no more. PDP is PV, PV12, at best case scenario, maybe PV15 or, or even higher discount rates for PDP. So until that normalizes, uh, we're still going to be so, still we're still going to see somewhat of a bid ask spread between buyers and sellers, but hopefully with increased prices, uh, you know, particularly crude prices, we'll see those uh, bid ask spreads uh, narrow. Uh, the other thing, finally, is you know when we go into a data room with a seller's package, we we really need to hone in on the engineering, uh, particularly PDP as well as upside, but PDP, uh, we've, we've gotten word back, not necessarily in our, in our processes, but uh, overall in general, we're seeing a disconnect between seller's engineering and buyer's engineering, whether it be PDP or upside engineering. Um, it seems like there's a, there's a higher risk um, element to, uh, to buyers where they're putting a lot higher risk factor on those reserves and checking and tr making sure that they check all the boxes before they sign off on any, any engineering being uh, proposed by a, by a seller. Farley, I'll start with you on this next question and then Robert would like to hear your perspective as well. Farley, what would you say was the differentiator between you and other competitors in the last acquisition or acquisitions uh, that you've closed? And how do you see such differences playing out in future transactions? Uh, the last deal we closed, I'd say that, you know, we were, it was our commerciality, um, you know, and then coupled with our speed and our certainty of getting to the, you know, the closing table. Um, it was a situation that, you know, 
Um, again, you know, a lot of things we're chasing are, you know, owned, are economically owned by unnatural owners, i.e. banks and or note holders. So whenever they decide they want to, you know, sell something, they're, they're looking for certainty and speed. Um, you know, that particular deal, again, you know, it was a, a situation where they're trying to extract value from multiple assets. And it was a bit of a Rubik's cube as to how that fit together. But like we say a lot to to our you know equity constituency over here, you know we are trying to be viewed as a solution provider as much as a counterparty. So on on that particular deal, it was very much you know a little bit of a being a solution provider. So and that's the track record we're trying to build is that you know if um, you know if we say we're gonna you know transact, we're gonna transact and we'll get theirs get up and down on it as quick as we can. Yeah, I'd say um, our last transaction was a little unique and maybe our whole differentiating story is a little unique in that, um, you know, we've got a track record as a public company. This is our fourth public company. It's not like we're building. Um, I'm looking out my window and can see Anadarko. So we're not building an Anadarko that's going to be around for, you know, 50 years or what have you. Um, we, we've got a financial disciplined approach and we've got a very technical approach so like Charlie was mentioning a, a moment ago you go into these data rooms and and um, sometimes the seller's engineering uh, is maybe done at a much less quality than what we would put into it ourselves of course we're the buyer and we've got to put in some risk but uh, you know and then and then the way we operate as a company um, has some differentiation uh, compared to some of the peers out there that we might be competing with. Um, so when you look at our last transaction, we used equity. We probably hit the market uh, as well-timed as you could in terms of both the uptick in prices, the uptick in uh, the banking uh, facilities being uh, in improving quite a bit, uh, as well as the equity markets improving. Uh, and we caught a seller at the right time, knowing that they needed more scale in their business and they didn't want to take 100 percent cash uh, and they were willing to take some equity. So I think when you put all that together, that's what's going to differentiate us in the future is um, be, as to being a natural consolidator in certain places is that we've got a strong balance sheet. We're willing to use some of that. We're not going to correct somebody's problem, but we're willing to use a piece of that. And then we're willing to provide some upside via our equity. So that makes us uh, maybe a little different than others out there. Thank you, Robert and Farley. Uh, interesting comments. Charlie, here's a, here's a question for you. As an A&D and advisor, what do you plan to do to best help our clients in sell-side processes in 2021? Well, Brad, as you know, I think, I think the, you know, we always try to keep the ultimate goal um, of, of having a happy client at the end of a transaction, which means we're going to have a we're going to have a closed transaction at a value that meets the, the client's expectations. Um, but in order to get get a successful transaction and a closed transaction, we're always mindful that even though we work for the client, our true customers in any sales transaction is is uh, the buyer themselves. You know. Uh, so we really keep them at the at the forefront of our thinking every time we go into a sales process. We 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 kind of put our put our feet in the shoes of a buyer every time we go into a into a VDR and present the sellers sellers assets to the market. So what we've done is we we've, we've built an A and D team with the right skill set and right experience, uh, and they have the right uh, uh, ana analytical tools to to allow us to sec successfully cater. The buyer's needs to make sure that we present the client's asset package in a well-organized and fully analyzed fashion so that buyers fully understand the client's assets and the value proposition being offered to them. So, you know, the ultimate goal is to, to, to make the offering as competitive as possible so that we can maximize value for our clients. Thank you. And, and to add to that, one thing that I think is helpful, you know, from our clients and, and friends perspective that are considering selling is we've always felt that it's difficult to time a sell side appropriately, uh, given the fluctuations in the market and commodity prices. 
So one, one thing that we always tell our friends and clients, if you're contemplating a sell side process, we always feel it is in their best interest to, to be ready as, as soon as possible. Does not mean that the company has to make the commitment or decision to sell, but if that is what they intend on doing, then they can at least have that part of the process in the rear view mirror. So what we're doing at the moment with a lot of our clients and friends is actually preparing materials, analyses, uh, and documentation to uh, embark on a sell side process if that's the way they, they wanna go. Again, we think these cycles, uh, they're hard to time, and they may be even a little bit impressed, maybe more so than what we saw uh, when we look back in history as well. So, uh, Charlie, thank you for your comments. Robert, you and Farley as well. Charlie, I'll turn it over to you to uh, moderate the next section. Thanks, Brad. So this next section deals with capital allocation. And um, so this first question is, is first for Farley and then for Robert. Uh, Farley, please discuss your company's growth plans for 2021. Uh, do you plan to grow assets and production? Or instead, do you plan to hold production flat in 2021? If your firm will hold production flat, will you focus more on distributing excess cash flow to investors, or do you plan on paying down debt? Well, I, I think, you know, we think of growth as, you know, an output of successful capital investment. So, you know, so much of our stated strategy is absolutely, you know, being a consolidator and, and acquiring barrels. So, you know, that is where most of our, that's where most of our focus is. Those events are binary in nature. So it's hard to forecast, you know, how much production and or reserves that's going to add to our business at any given point in time. All that being said, you know, we, we certainly have organic, you know, capital plans that, you know, are, you know, we, we think about it in terms of, you know, PV to investment. So we try to maximize, you know, that ratio as much as we can. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, we have a lot of competition for capital in the business today, you know, inorganically and organically. And as it relates to your, the last part of your question, Charlie, about, you know, what we do with, you know, organic cash flow, you know, obviously we're, you know, trying to, you know, make, you know, smart, you know, investment decisions, but to the extent that we can't do that, you know, we're, you know, we're paying down debt, um, you know, projected this year on a baseline, you know, we've publicly stated that, you know, we'll be less than half a turn of leverage at the end of 2021. So, you know, we have a very low leverage profile and a, and a nice healthy asset base to to hopefully fuel you know those acquisitions going forward. Yeah, from Earthstone's perspective, we're not trying to balance. And I think uh, Farley said this: it's kind of binary: the acquisition capital versus uh, a, a capital program related to a drilling program or what have you. So we first focus on our capital drilling program. And uh, this year we're gonna spend a hundred million dollars or so running a one rig program in the Midland Basin. And then um, we'll continue to pay down debt, but we'll have a significant amount of free cash flow this year from that uh, drilling program. And, and uh, we'll develop about 20,000 BOE a day, maybe a little bit more this year on our, on our program. Uh, given that we did an acquisition and closed it early in the year, um, you know, growth from last year is going to be pretty ter terrific. Uh, we averaged a little over 15,000 BOE a day last year. So from that standpoint, we're growing our production base um, pretty much uh, in well in line with our acquisition um, stated goals there. Um, we're focused on paying down debt to a certain level and then trying to find ways to use that capital to grow our business as well through acquisitions or opportunities that might come along. Uh, that those being important to us in our basins of focus, the Midland Basin and the Eagleford. So we're not going to uh, plan any distributions in the near, near term. I think we're better focused on ramping up EBITDAX and living close to cash flow uh, levels in order to uh, grow our business. Thanks for that, Robert and Farley. Uh, Farley, this next question is for you. Um, how is how is your firm thinking about capital allocation plans with regards to asset acquisitions or mergers in 2021? Um, and do you have specific growth targets 
for your business that you can share with us? We don't, we don't, again, I, I, a lot of these things are just big and binary, Charlie. So it's really hard for us to, to, to say, you know, that we have a, you know, a certain plan. I mean, you know, look, we've, we've, we've doubled and tripled the production and reserve base of this business over the last 16 months, you know, twice now. So, um, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're very squarely focused on those things. We're also focused on, you know, where we've made acquisitions, where we can increase NRI via bolt-ons of working interest and the like. Um, those are things that, that we think are accretive to, you know, the, the acquisitions and the, and the data that we have on those acquisitions. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, you know, we don't, we just don't have that, you know, a, a nice round number that we, that we, you know, I mean, certainly we have our, you know, internal kind of goals, but, but we don't have a nice round number there, but it's, it's absolutely inorganic growth is our focus. Uh, Robert, this next question is for you, uh, kind of following up on that prior question. Um, can you discuss your company's appetite for conducting new acquisitions versus, versus drilling existing inventory in 2021? Um, and what has been your criteria for making that, that decision? Yeah, I think I sort of spilled the, a little, gave you a little bit of preview, but we, we definitely have an appetite to consolidate and we are uh, very busy looking at new opportunities throughout um, the Eagleford and the Midland Basin and even the Delaware Basin to a lesser extent. Uh, we don't see that you've got to do one or the other. Uh, the way we view it is to be in the, uh, to attract sustainable investors, you've got to have scale. You've got to be of a certain size. And we've breached the $500 million market cap size. We need to breach the 2 billion size to where we get the right kind of longer term shareholders perhaps and new shareholders compared to where we sit today. Uh, not that we have bad shareholders, we just need more of them, the long holders. Um, so we're gonna continue to look for acquisitions, but we're gonna have a capital program We've got the appetite and the and the capability internally to uh, drill wells and return and, and and have good drilling economics and return good good uh, shareholder create good shareholder value. This this question really wasn't on the list, but it's kind of a related question. Um, is there more of an incentive for for Earthstone to to drill maybe more wells than normal because? of lower DNC costs that you're seeing in the market today? Well, we are in a very um, unusual point in time where you've got low service costs and we'll call them high prices. We saw that once before, and maybe it was early 2015, and people were drilling core of their core, whether it's the Eagleford Bakken, and then Wolf Camp maybe wasn't quite as uh, far along in its trajectory, and their returns were super high. And we're seeing the same thing today, right? So if you can go out and accelerate capital plans, your returns are really good right now, given how low DNC is. So we're thinking about that second rig and we're thinking about the timing of it. We don't have it nailed down yet, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if later this year we don't pick up a second rig um, because of the current environment. This next question is for Farley first and then Robert. Um, for new opportunities, what are your main priorities? Uh, for example, are you primarily focused on capturing new opportunities in specific basins? Um, and does your firm have a preference regarding oil versus gas acquisitions? Number one is value. So, you know, it's all about, you know, value to us, you know, making, you know, good disciplined capital decisions. Um, you know, so I would, I would start there, Charlie. I, I think that Beyond that, you know, we're relatively agnostic. You know, we we probably prefer liquids a little bit more over, you know, um, you know, gas and the like. Um, I'd say that we right now we're looking more towards because we're you know, a PDP roll up you know strategy. I mean, we're we're focused a little bit more on you know conventional longer lived assets because um, and and it's just we we will trade capital intensity for you know higher lifting costs that's just fundamentally the way that we think about the business today and so we would rather aggregate you know um larger transactions higher return on effort you know chasing value you know more liquids rich yeah that, that's a, that's a great strategy if you can operate in a lot of different basins like farley and his team do and and and, and it works really well we're we're value chasers as well. 
we're a little bit more oil focused, uh, but playing in the Eagleford or the Midland Basin or the Delaware, um, we're, we're open to finding deals that are maybe a little bit more gassier. Uh, but long term, our overall corporate profile, I'll bet, will still be somewhere between 55 and 60 percent oil weighted uh, and therefore more liquids weighted to begin with and uh, value driven, much like uh, Farley mentioned, PDP focused. Uh, but at the same time, if inventory can come along with it, we're willing to uh, to put the effort in to go uh, figure that out and drill wells. Thanks, guys. Uh, Robert, this next question is for you. Um, as as the renewables and ESG trend continues to gain attention, this is becoming an increasingly important issue for investors and energy companies. So how do you see uh, environmental, social, and governance factors or renewable energy sources impacting your business and investment uh, decisions, either directly or indirectly in 2021 and beyond? Yeah, thanks for this. Um... Most of these are easy, easier to answer. This is this is a diff, not a difficult one. It's just not a fad. Neither of those two items you talk about, ESG and renewables, are fads, right? They are here for the long haul, and they're going to become become more prominent in our business. And in some cases, it's just going to take more effort on our part to communicate, like ESG, and we're going to have to make some changes. And the renewables are going to be somewhat of a competitor. And we're going to have to deal with that and continue to be uh, good operators and good stewards of capital. So on the ESG front, I think the industry in total has just done a poor job of communicating what we do environmentally. And as it relates to Earthstone being a small cap company, um, maybe we shouldn't be put on a pedestal at the forefront of ESG. But at some point, we've got to fall in line with the disclosures that are being made by the larger companies. Uh, and I'm not talking the Exxons and Chevrons. I'm talking like um, the bigger companies that are in our peer group, the SMs and whatnot, that are, you know, that next tier down that that we need to follow their examples of how we report. We've done a great job over our careers and, and environmental responsibility has always been important. Uh, and we, we are cautious about how we treat the environment. We deal with um, population centers close to Midland, and yeah, they may not be very big, but it's important to those people who live nearby. So we have to be protective of their ground, and we work on some very large ranches where people are pretty protective of how, how we operate on those ranches, uh, and we've done a good job of mitigating um, uh, flaring, air emissions. Uh, we've reduced truck traffic which has double benefit of not only getting oil, for instance, or water on pipelines, reducing emissions, but also from the S, the social standpoint of safety. And we reduce a lot of truck traffic and therefore you reduce the number of accidents that occur on the road. Um, the governance side is a little bit um, different for a small cap company who is, um, well, we'll just say a controlled company. Having large shareholder and today, two large shareholders, um, we, we have pretty strong governance, although it doesn't live up to the same standards that a, uh, some of these rating agencies would put on a larger company because we can't have a 100% independent board because we have companies, private equity firms who have invested a lot of dollars, and they're very cautious about opening it up just to anybody to come in and sit on that board. So it creates a little bit of a dynamic there where over the long haul, we will improve that governance. Definitely from a shareholder alignment, we're there on the compensation side. Um, cash compensation in our entity has always been below the peer group. Um, on the long-term incentive equity compensation, we've been maybe a little bit ahead, but it's all performance-based or 75% of it is performance-based. So if we don't perform, and our shareholder value doesn't go up because it is now based on absolute shareholder value. If that doesn't increase, then we don't get anything. And so we feel pretty strongly there. And then again, on the renewables front, that's a long-term investment thesis. Um, we, we are going to have folks that we have to probably balance uh, or, or compete for um, investment dollars. You know, and the investors are looking at all kinds of things. And as long as we put up good metrics and we are, uh, creating a sustainable business, and we're living to ESG goals that make sense, 
then I think that's the best we can do. This business is going to be around for a long time. Farley and I are going to be long gone and it's still going to be here. Uh, but uh, we've got to be um, uh, sensitive to what those investors are looking for. And, and we're doing that every day at, at Earthstone. Yeah, I appreciate your, uh, your insight there. Uh, kind of changing gears for a second. And, and this is the last set of questions. Uh, so the last question or two is about the availability and options for capital for both Earthstone and, and Contango. Robert, I'll start, I'll start with you. What have equity investors been expressing to your company most so far this year? You know, it's really unique over the past, uh, we won't say past year, but maybe over the past eight to nine months that uh, we have not been able to meet with investors face to face, obviously. And we've had more uh, virtual investor meetings or non-deal roadshows. And because of that, we've actually had access to investors that we probably wouldn't otherwise have if you did an in-person typical conference um, because their conference schedule is so packed. Now we've had the ability to meet with some new investors uh, because virtually they can schedule a half hour meeting over three days a whole lot easier. So it's been um, refreshing in that regard, um, as difficult as it is. Uh, and at the same time, we've seen some new investors interested in the story start buying some of our uh, our shares. So that's a good outcome for us. Uh, the message from them is, you know, or the questions that we get a lot is, you know, acceleration of capital or how are you going to deal with capital? What are you doing with the excess funds? And we're going to pay down debt as fast as we can. And then maybe at some point we'll run two rigs. Uh, we also are very vocal about uh, being acquisitive and being a consolidator and that's no secret and we're not bashful about the way we talk to investors is that you know some manageable level of debt related to your EBITDAX uh, makes sense what is that number it's not a hard line in the sand but it depends on the asset you're buying and that every deal is looked at independently uh, and we don't just say it can't be more than one times leverage that doesn't necessarily work if you buy a high PDP uh, throwing off a lot of cash flow uh, to pay down debt. So the investors have uh, listened to our responses. And in some cases, like I said, we've even got some new ones coming into our story. So, so far, so good and, and appreciative that uh, we actually have the opportunity to visit with them. Great. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, any follow up to, to Robert's comments there? Yeah, just a few comments. You know, if we're on the sell side for clients, um, we're dealing with buyers, so either directly or indirectly, we're also talking to their equity investors when we when we market assets. And it seems like uh, you know in the last 12 months, we've seen more and more buyers and their equity investors more interested in PDP weighted deals, deals that cash flow immediately, um, and, and tra transactions that will help them delever their company. The, all, the, the other thing that we've seen recently that's a little bit different than the last three to five years is that we've seen more interest in natural gas weighted assets. We recently marketed, as you know, Brad marketed a deal in the Haynesville in East Texas, and, and we saw significant interest uh, in that deal. Um, so natural gas is more of a priority for, for equity investors, it seems like. And then maybe that ties into the ESG theme as well, being a, a cleaner uh, fossil fuel, so to speak. The other thing that we're seeing too is, is is investors are stressing ESG angles, given the feedback they're receiving from their from their institutional investors in the broader market in general. And and finally, uh, the, the stress seems to be more on deals that are that are bolt-ons versus just pure buying assets to acquire assets for for growth sake. There has to be a, another angle that they can they can increase their scale, lower their costs, and those seems to be more bolt on versus pure pure acquisitions of, of of assets in any any basin whatsoever. Farley, this this question is for you and Robert. You know, touched on conversations he's having with his equity shareholders. Uh, this question is more on the on the debt side of the equation. What conversations or themes are you hearing from debt providers as it relates to the A&D market and acquisitions? Well, I think, you know, you got your 
you know, your money center banks and your RBL facility, you know, providers, our syndicate, you know, has been very supportive of us. They've been great partners. Um, the sequencing has, was, was difficult to be frank about, you know, the, the last, you know, with regard to the last two transactions we did. So, you know, we over equitized to mitigate, you know, basically what I referred to earlier, the speed to transact. So, you know, we just had to take that almost out of the equation because I think, you know, 2020 was such a rough year for a lot of RBL bankers and getting a syndicate to agree on, you know, a borrowing base, you know, <laughs> during, you know, everything that was going on last year was just, you know, it was a fool's errand. So, you know, we kind of just, you know, mitigated that by, you know, going about over equitizing the last couple of transactions we did. Um, as we've, you know, gotten back into discussions with them, you know, it seems to us that, you know, look, there's, there's a real, you know, ceiling to how much capital you can get via the RBL market. And, and, you know, so we've, we've been looking and watching at this, this high yield market. Um, it's white hot, you know, there's lots of people looking for yield. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we don't, we don't want to, you know, over lever our business, um, or have a high cost of capital, you know, if we were to go down that path, but, you know, that market is there. And, you know, because, you know, we would potentially look at that market, you know, not for dividend recap sake or not for, you know, uh, drilling capital, let's say, you know, it'd be, you know, more around, you know, some kind of, you know, acquisition type event, you know, we think that, you know, that might be a better way to tap that market. So we're, we're, we're monitoring that, that market's there. Um, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, and it's, a, it's a lot deeper than the RBL market. So, you know, we're really just trying to get our arms around and talk to as many people as we can, you know, that have, you know, insights into the availability, the speed and the, and the scale of, of those, those various types of debt, debt capital markets. Thank you, Farley. Charlie, anything to, to add to that? Um, you know, the RBL market, uh, unfortunately, is uh, I, I think the way I would describe it is just un unenthusiastic, you know, versus how it was five years ago. Um, and of course, when we're trying to sell an asset, a lot of our buyers, if it's a PDP weighted deal, they're looking to the RBL market to finance that acquisition. And because of the lower advance rates and the relatively higher higher interest rates uh, being offered by the R RBL market, because it is, I'll say, unenthusiastic or, or relatively dead, uh, it's put more pressure on equity investors and equity to bridge the gap, which they're unwilling to do in most cases. Um, so it just makes it, it makes A and D transactions uh, a lot more difficult to get done because of that. Um, so that's that's pretty much what I'd add. Great, Charlie Farley, thank you. And and along those same same lines, uh, you know, Robert, we've certainly heard their perspective on the debt markets and the RBL market, and certainly everyone listening is well aware of the headwinds that faced the industry last year. In the last month or weeks or or quarter, have you have you seen that improve at all? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I echo everybody's sentiment about how difficult the RBL market um, has been. Uh, I'm optimistic. I drill wells every day, and you can always run into a disaster. Um, it feels a lot better, uh, and we're going through redetermination right now, and I'll be able to uh, comment further, you know, in a month or so when we get it done. But, you know, you step back to our IRM tra transaction last year, and prior to Labor Day, we'll call it, um, there was no appetite in the market whatsoever. And we even considered going to the term loan market to be able to fill the void that the equity was, uh, was taking. Um, as you got past Labor Day and you know, we announced it December 17th, but obviously a lot of work went in ahead of time, as you guys know, uh, our deal was oversubscribed. Um, significantly oversubscribed and overcommitted capital, which we didn't use at all. We hopefully saved a little back for the next deal or for this redetermination. But as we got later in the year and as we've turned the corner, I think we've seen that market get better. And for us, and, and I think Charlie mentioned, it, it's the lifeblood of doing smaller deals. We're not at the position yet where we can go uh, 
make hay in that white heart market called the high yield market. And boy, are we ready to do that. But I think we need another deal or two, uh, depending on size, to be able to do that. So we're hopeful and, and optimistic that the RBL market will um, at least be a little better come this spring. But that's not to say that it's going to improve to where it was three, four, five years ago. I think we're going to see less banks involved in RBLs in the future, and they're going to be very discerning on where their capital dollars go. So this is our last question for today's conversation. Farley, I'll start with you and then ask you to hand it off to, to Robert. What are your thoughts on commodity prices for the balance of the year? What are you going to be looking at? I'll also ask you, how are you thinking about hedging at the moment? Well, I mean, to be to be honest, I, I, I wish I knew what commodity prices were going to do, but there's, <laughs> there's, I, I have no idea. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, look, we are long-term bullish on hydrocarbons. So let's just start there. Um, we just think that, you know, um, there's, there's just going to be a lot of, you know, opportunity to, 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 you know, aggregate assets and, and do it responsibly. And, and ultimately we think that is not going away in the near term. Um, and, you know, as it relates to hedges, I mean, you know, look, we look at them as instruments that smooth out volatility and, and, you know, help us forecast our cash flow and, and, you know, uh, you know, ex you know, basically, you know, execute on our, on our baseline capital plan. So, you know, we, we have, we have a, you know, it's harder to do that in, in the out years. Um, but, you know, we, we absolutely are all about taking price, you know, in, you know, at settlement, you know, on these, on these acquisitions that we're doing and, and view that as something that's prudent to do. So, but uh, as it relates to price, you know, we just, we're just trying to block and tackle and take what the market gives us, you know, on the acquisition front. Wow. I was hoping he would tell us what oil prices are going to do the rest of this year, because then they'll tell us what we should do hedging wise. Uh, I, I've, I've got the same comments that Farley does for the most part. You know, we, we're we a strong believer in hedges to take out that financial risk. Uh, we were very well hedged last year, and it put our uh, realized prices at a pretty high uh, number. And in terms of uh, cash margins for BOE out of our peer group, Permian players, we were better off than even the large cap guys. We had the highest out of that Permian peer group. So this year, it's probably going to flip itself uh, if you look at it, because, again, we're 80 plus percent hedged on our oil production for the year. Uh, just the financial discipline, we're not going to play that. We think that oil's a 40 to $60 game over the next few years. And so when oil's over 50, we're going to do some hedging. And, and when it's lower than 50, we're probably going to just sit back and watch a little bit. Uh, and that's about where we are this year. On average, is about 50. We took on some IRM hedges that were below that level, so we ended up about 50. Um, and as our program gets bigger, we'll take advantage of the upside in price that we've seen here recently, or we've underpinned our capital pre program. We've locked in kind of what we think our cash flows are. We've uh, made sure we're going to be able to cover G&A and interest, all those kinds of things. So it's an important part of our business, especially as you do acquisitions, to kind of figure out but it is a balancing act between what investors want and some investors want exposure to commodities. Uh, and, it, and, and we're not going to give them all that exposure they want because I don't want to be exposed to the downside price risk that I think is, uh, is always possible in this business. Uh, who, whoever thought COVID would do what it did last year and last as long as it has. So with that, that's where we are on the, on the hedging and price talk. Thank you, Charlie, any thoughts? Um, as I was preparing for this question, uh, you know, I'd look back at the average annual prices for oil and gas just to see how 2020 stacked up to to the recent past. And I had to go all the way back. You know, last year, 2020, the average price for oil was thirty nine dollars and 16 cents for gas. It was two dollars and three cents for oil. You have to go all the way back to 2003 to get a to get a of that, you know, price for oil that's low, lower than 40. Um, and for gas, you have to go all the way back to 1998. But I think hopefully the dynamics are changing because of ESG, because of the number of rigs running today. 
because of uh, OPEC on the on the flip side. I think there's spare capa- significant spare capacity that OPEC has to the tune of seven, eight million barrels a day that can easily absorb any increases in demand we might see because of the pandemic getting in the rearview mirror. So uh, bottom line is um, I agree with Robert. I think oil is a 40 to $60 commodity for the time being uh, until some of the, uh, some of the supply demand dynamics significantly change and gas. Uh, I'm hopeful that because of a cleaner energy, uh, there's going to be more demand there, more LNG uh demands uh and we'll see higher than certainly two two dollars and two dollars and fifty cents in mcf uh and get more more into the three dollar area for gas thank you charlie robert and uh and farley for for those comments and echoing a lot of what we've said uh on the call today i think we everyone listening and all of us on the call today realize how challenged uh you know 20 was with New administration, COVID, OPEC, Russia, uh, tremendous amount of headwind throughout the year. Uh, feels like that uh, that really, you know, starting a couple months ago, things have gotten tremendously better. Uh, our pipeline is filling. We are starting to see quite a few companies come to market that want to sell, not need to sell. And we're also seeing some value being allocated to upside uh, in some of these transactions. So uh, appreciate your time. Um, on on those comments. Charlie, I'll I'll turn it over to you to conclude. Well, this has been a fantastic uh, and great discussion of the current state of the A&D market. As far as I'm concerned, I I know Brad agrees. Um, Thanks again, Robert and Farley, for sharing your thoughts and insights. have been extremely valuable, and I'm sure our our viewers are going to feel the same way. So this concludes our state of the acquisitions and divestitures in the oil and gas market, a Stevens Investment Banking webinar panel in collaboration with Farley Dakin of Contango Oil and Gas Company and Robert Anderson of Earthstone Energy. Uh, Be sure to view the rest of our virtual thought leadership series online. Have a great day. For more critical insights from Stevens Investment Banking or to learn more about working with us, please visit stevens.com or contact Stevens Investment Banking at stevens.com.